Bein Hamitzarim, the three weeks of danger, the three weeks of trouble, the three hard weeks is coming up. Um, we never did get the date on the Jewish calendar. I think we're at the very end of Sivan. So like uh, the 17th of Tammuz is when it starts. And I'm going to be taking two weeks off during Bein Hamitzarim. So we won't have services during that time. All right. Let's say the prayer for the pictures. Ready? Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Et Kol Darka LaAmo Yisrael Ketav Niot LaKol HaDevarim Shabbat Shalom. Blessed are you, Lord our God, everlasting King, who has given all of His ways to His people Israel as pictures of all heavenly things. Man, I love that prayer. I, I, just, I even love the way it looks. It just looks good. I love the Hebrew in it, love the way it looks, love the way it sounds, love the way it means, love what it means, obviously. All right, so we are in the desert, Bamibar. Bamibar means in the desert. And by the way, another announcement I forgot. If you want to receive the, 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 these notes, uh, all you have to do is give me your email address, and I, I send out the uh, I send out the PowerPoint with the notes on it every week. So if you give me your email address, I can uh, put you on that list, and you can receive notes every week. You can look at them before the teaching, and have them during the teaching. So this teaching, we are in the Torah portion called Shalach, which means apostle or sent sent out. And in this, in this form, it's just kind of like a command. Not a command, but a, I don't know what, I think it's called the infinitive form of the verb. It's just like saying it, which is sen, sen. And we're going to look at this a lot. This first phrase starts out in bold in the first line. Send out men for yourself. We're going to look at this over and over and over again to suck all the juices out of it to see what it means. So we're in Bibi Bar chapter 13. And I think to start out with, we're just going to read what's here. The Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Send out men for yourself to tour the land that I'm going to give the sons of Israel. You shall send one man, one man, from each of their father's tribes, all of them leaders. So Moshe sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the mouth of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. When Moshe sent them, this is now the fourth time, one, two, three, four, the fourth time, you can see them bolded four times, where it says, who sent them out? Who sent them out? It's four times. Who sent them out? Okay, can, can y'all pay attention, please? First one, send out men for yourself. Second one, you shall send. Who's that? Moshe. Moshe. Third one, so Moses sent. Moses. Fourth one, Moses sent them. So four times, sounds like Moses sends them, right? Yeah. All right. To tour the land, he said to them, go up into the Negev, then go up into the hill country, see what the land is. Is it good or bad? So they went up and they toured the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehov and Levo Hamat, the entrance of Hamat. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two, with some pomegranates and some figs. When they returned from touring the land at the end of forty days, they came to the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land, and they reported. We came into the land where you sent us. Who sent them? Moshe. Okay. Sounds like it, right? And it does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified, and huge, huge cities. And indeed, we saw the de descendants of Anak, which is the giant there. Okay, so we got five times here where it says very clearly 
God told Moses to send them. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. Except it's not clear at all. <laughs> it's just not. Of course not. So, first question is, where did God go? Where did the apostles go? So this is a map. Now, most uh, biblical readers, most biblical scholars, most biblical students, they put the Kadesh right here. In the middle of the boundary, the, the south boundary of Israel. Right here. Actually, right here, right inside the boundary. But that is wrong. Because it clearly says, over and over again, that Kadesh is not inside the boundary of Israel. It is next to, in fact, historically sometimes, part of the land of Edom. It is not part of the land of Israel. This is Kadesh. We did this huge study last year. I came up with eight maps. Eight maps. I was looking at it. That's a lot of work. A lot of study. And we did a huge study to figure out that the Jewish people did not wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They wandered for the first year down from Mount Sinai up to Kadesh. And there they stayed for 38 years. That's it. They were in Kadesh. And the scriptures say it several times. We did all the study. If you want to go look at those teachings from last year, from this Torah portion on for the next, I believe, five Torah portions, we went over and over and over it, that they were in Kadesh, which is modern Petra, in Jordan. So they're sending, Moshe is sending them out from Kadesh. Now, Rashi says that the, that the, the shape of their journey was like the Greek letter gamma, I believe, which is just basically a right angle like that. And this is what they did. They went from Kadesh, like that, and then right angle straight up all the way up to Lake Ophelot. All the way up in Lebanon. And that was the border of the land of Israel, Lebanon. So, if, if this is Kadesh, how could they go in a, in a shape of a gamma? Um, right angle. It's impossible. So, that's the shape, and that's where they went in their journey. And the verse is, send out men for yourself to tour the land of Canaan. Now, also last year, we did a big study on the word, um, the spies. I believe it was two years ago and last year. It's not spies. It never says spies. It says, in Hebrew, literally, tour. The, the tur the, what they call the turtle dove, the dove. And it means, uh, it means a cycle of time. Tour. And they were tourists. And it literally says the word tour. I think 15 times when it's talking about the quote spies, that they quote spy in Israel, it's the word tour. Tour, just like American, like English, the tourists. And they toured the land. So they, he says, send out men for yourself to tour the land of Canaan which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. So they went up and they toured the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehov at Libo Kamat, the entrance of Kamat. Look at this, this is higher than Sinai in Lebanon. And look how much higher it is. And that's the land of Israel. So literally, most of Lebanon is part of Israel. That's another story. Most of Lebanon is part of Israel. This verse again. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Send out men for yourself to tour the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send one man, one man. It says it twice. One man, one man. Each of their father's tribes, all leaders among them. So my question is, whose idea was it? Whose idea was it? Was it God's idea? Was it Moses' idea? Was it Israel's idea? Whose idea was it to send, you know, to go look at the land and tour it and figure it out how to take it? 
All right, so that was my question, and you know, I, I bopped back and forth. It was God's, it was Moses, it was Israel's, it was God's, it was Moses, over and over again. And then I read Rashi, and I was like, oh, I guess they had the same question. This is what Rashi said. Send for yourself, according to your own understanding, according to your own understanding, I am not commanding you, but if you wish, you may send. Since the Israelites had come to Moshe and said, let us send. Whose idea was it? Israel. Israel came to Moses and said, let us send men ahead of us. As it says, all of you approached me. That's in Deuteronomy 1.22. So it says it. It says it in Deuteronomy. That Israel came to Moshe and said, we want to send men. And yet, they didn't have faith to take the land. But they said, let us send men. So why do you think they did it? Let us send men, as it says, all of you approach me. Moshe took counsel with the Holy Spirit. That's the Shekhinah. Moses took counsel with the Holy Spirit. And God said, I told them that it's good. It's a good idea. As it says, I will bring you up from the affliction of Egypt in Exodus 3. Now look at this part, the last part. By their lives, that means I'm making an oath. By their lives, now I will give them the opportunity to make a mistake, to err. That means make a mistake. Through the words of the, he says, spies, so that they will not inherit it, so that they will not inherited. So, whose idea was it to go up to the land? No. It was Israel's. It was Israel's. God said, I'm going to take you out of Egypt and I'm going to bring you into the land, right? I'm going to give it to you. But it was Israel's idea to send men, spies. That was their idea. And then Moshe goes to God and says, look, they're telling me to, you know, send men. I want to send men. They want to send men in to spy out the thing so we can take it. And God says, well, I'm not commanding you to do it. I'm leaving it up to your own free will. If you want to do it, do it. But the end of this thing that Rashi says is he did it to give an opportunity to make a mistake. Now, I'm, just going to, I'm not going to just leave it like that. I'm going to translate what this means. When they return from touring the land at the end of 40 days. Now, before we go back into the meat of the teaching, which is about free will. It's about free will. Everybody wants to know about free will. How does it work with God's will? Now, if, if you believe that God gives commands and that you can obey them or not obey them, this will make no sense to you. None. But if you can see God's word as a bunch of patterns that teach about him and leave it at that, it'll make perfect sense. But if you're thinking that God gives commands, this isn't going to make sense. It's going to confuse you. So I'm going to try to make as much sense of this as I can for you. So we have to talk about when this was because this time period is coming up. It's called the ninth of Av when both temples were destroyed. When they returned from touring the land, at the end of 40 days, they came to the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and gave their report, right? Now it says in the Talmud and the Mishnah, it says this, five things, bad things, happened to our ancestors on the 17th of Tammuz, and five things happened on the 9th of Av. Now the 17th of Tammuz is in about two, two and a half weeks. 9th of Av is three weeks after that. <clears throat> five bad things happened on the 9th of Av. On the 17th of Tammuz, the tablets were broken, the daily burnt offering was nullified, the city was breached, the city of Jerusalem was breached, Apostamos burned the Torah and he set up an idol in the sanctuary. That's 17th Tammuz. But on the 9th of Av, the day we're looking at, 
It was decreed to our ancestors that they would not enter the land. So Israel comes back. They bring back word, a quote, bad report. They do the Shon Hara about the land, which is uh, uh, gossip, bad words about the land. And God says, you are never, never going to enter my my land, my rest. You're never going to enter my land. All right. This happened on the ninth of Av. The first and the second temples were destroyed. The city of Betar was taken. The city of Jerusalem was plowed up. So when one enters the month of Av, he decreases joy. These are bad things that happen on the ninth of Av. First one that happened was what we're talking about today. That they came back with this evil report and God said, no mas. All right, so we're still talking about the when. But we're going to look at the verses now. So you can see that the, that the Talmud is not just playing games. They knew the scriptures. The sages knew the scriptures in a way that we can't even imagine. They had no concordances. They had no Jacinius lexicon. They had no internet. They had nothing. They memorized everything in the Torah, in their heart. And they knew it in Hebrew, and they knew it in Greek, and they knew it in Aramaic, and they knew it in 65 other languages. I don't know how that's possible, but they did. That's what the, that's what the Talmud says. But they knew the scriptures like we can't even imagine. So this is a passage from the Talmud that says, why do we say that this happened on the ninth of Av? This is important. You need to understand that God set this day as a rehearsal, as an appointment. So, it says in the Talmud, on the ninth of Av, it was decreed that our fathers should not enter the promised land. How do we know this? For it is written, and it came to pass in the first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was erected. The tabernacle was set up. I'm going to go to that. Exodus 40, 17. Came to pass in the first month. What's the first month? Nisan. Thank you, I mean. It came about in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, so it's Nisan 1, 1-1, one, one, that the tabernacle was erected, and Moshe erected the Mishkan. It talks about all the things that he did to set up the tabernacle. And then it says in verse 34, Then the cloud, of, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the Mishkan, and... We're done. They were ready to go. All right. When was that? 1-1. One, one, Nisan 1. Okay. Further it is written. So we're right, we're right here. Nisan 1. Further it is written that the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle of testimony. Now this is in Numbers chapter 10. Last week's Torah portion. Uh... 10, 11. Now it came about in the second year. So now it's a year later. In the second month. What's the second month? ER. Came about in the second month, on the 20th of the month, that the cloud was lifted from over the Mishkan of the testimony. And now they set out. And the sons of Israel set out on their journeys. All right. That's ER 2.20. On the 20th day of the month, the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle of testimony. And it is further written, and they set forward from the mountain, I'm sorry, from the mountain of the Lord three days' journey. Now this is 1033, last week's Torah portion. Thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey with the Ark of the Covenant, journeying in front of them for three days to seek out a resting place. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. All right. So now they've gone three days' journey. So we count three days. 
right? And Rabbi Hama ben Hanina explained this means that on that day they turned aside from the Lord. That's it. They've just set out from the Mount Sinai and they've turned their back on the Lord on that day that they set out. And we know this because last week's Torah portion, Numbers 11, verse 20, the very first thing that happens is they start lusting and God sends the quail because they're asking for bread. And remember, Moshe said, what am I supposed to do? Kill all the animals in the world for them to eat? Get all the fish in the world for them to eat? And so God brings quail. And it says, verse 20, for a whole month you're going to eat. So now we add 30 days. You following this? Yeah. Now we add 30 days. That brings us to the 22nd of Sivan. Sivan is the third month. So now we're to 322. And it is further written, and Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days. So now we got to add seven days to that. So 322 plus 7 is 329. Numbers 12, 15. That bracket brings us up to the 29th of Sivan, 329. Okay, so there's the counting. Is there something wrong with the counting? Okay. All right, so we have ER 23 plus 30 days. That brings us to Sivan 23 plus seven days for Miriam. That brings us to Sivan 30 plus 30 days of touring the land. That brings us to Tammuz, the end of Tammuz, plus 10 days because there's 40 days touring the land. So yeah, those 40 days brings you to the ninth of Av. So there's your counting, counting of how we know when it was that this occurred. Got it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I had the same question. It's is it twenty two or twenty three? And, and it, I had the same question. That's the question. I had the same question. And the rabbis answer it. I don't have it here because it's too long. They say that month was not a full month. Remember, the Hebrew months go by the moon. So they can be 29 days or 30 days. And so when you're counting 40 days, you can go either back a day or forward a day, depending on what the end of the month is. Remember, you have to count by the moon, by sight, not by numbers. So I, that's a good question. I have the same question. All right. So now we're coming back to the meat of the teaching. Whose idea was it? Israel. Israel. Whose idea was it? I mean, you know, it could have been God's, it could have been Moses, it could have been Israel, it could have been all three, it could have been Moses and God. Who knows? Except for the fact that in Deuteronomy 1, it tells us this. Then we set out from Oreb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness for 11 months, and that's it. This doesn't mean 40 years, it's just the first 11 months. Through all that great and terrible wilderness, and we came to Kadesh, and I said to you, look, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession, just as the Lord. Who's saying that? Who's saying go up and take the land? Moses. So whose idea is it? Moses, Moses, right? So far. So Moses says, go up. And here's the, here's the key. Do not fear. He tells them, go, just go, go take it. He doesn't say go send spies. He doesn't say go take your best warriors. He says, hey guys, go up and get it. Don't be afraid, just go do it. But you all approached me and said, let us send men ahead of us so that they may search out, tour the land and bring back to us word by, way, by the way by which we should go. 
and the cities which we should enter? What if we go the wrong way? What if we do the wrong thing? What if we go the wrong route? What if we, 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 we make a misstep and they destroy us? Then what? All you got to do is think back on all the stuff God did. And don't be afraid. But they didn't. They went to Moshe and started begging for an excuse to not go up and take the land. Because what had just happened? They just lusted after the women. It says meat, but it's the women. They wanted flesh. And God sends them quail for a month. So this is hot on the trail of them not listening to God. That's why they went to Moshe. They didn't go for a good idea. They went for a bad idea. And this is not the only time this has happened with Israel. But look what it says. The thing pleased me. I mean, this is, these are a bunch of jerks saying, we don't want to go. Well, let's try this. And Moses says, okay, the thing pleased me. Why did it please him? Because God said, I'm not commanding you. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. Just have faith in me. If you want to do it, do it. And so Moses says, oh, okay, okay. It pleases me. And I took 12 of your men, one man for each tribe. So things are not exactly as they appear, are they? So we got a problem. All right. So now we have to add to that this basic foundational thing that nobody knows. That they were not going into a land. I mean, you guys know this because I've taught it. Nobody knows this. This is a hidden thing, but it shouldn't be. They were not going into a land. Hebrews 3, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but Hebrews 3, 14, all the way through 4, 10, says this over and over and over and over and over and over. And yet people read it and go, what did it say? But it's very clear. God worked very hard to communicate this. So I tried to condense it to make it simple. As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. Can somebody get me some water? I don't know if there is any. <clears throat> today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. I was angry with this generation and said, I swore in my anger, they shall not enter my rest. When did God swear that they would not enter his rest? Nope. Nope. We just went over it. Thank you, honey. When did he say, you are not going in? Ninth of Av. We just went over it. The ninth of Av. Say it. Ninth of Av. Say ninth of Av. Ninth of Av. That's when he said this. Okay? That's why we're looking at this. Because that's when he said it. They, they had no faith. They sent their spies. They came back. They told Moses, we can't do it. And God said, I'm swearing to you. You will never, never enter my rest. Never. And then it says, Shaul, or whoever wrote Hebrews says, encourage one another as long as it is still called today. So this time period called today is a long time period. For we who have believed enter that rest. What rest? The rest that he said, you're never entering on the ninth of Av. What had they gone and looked at? What had they gone and toured? What had they toured? Say words to me. What had they gone and toured? The land. And God said, 
We who have believed enter that rest. We're going to enter Israel? But he told them, you're never, never entering my rest. Just as he said, I, and he says it again, he quotes it again. As I swore in my anger, they shall not enter my rest. But he's linking this with us. Right. He's linking that verse with us. He says, I said it to them, I'm saying it to you too. There is a time period that is coming still called my rest. And it is not today. As long as it's called today, you have a chance of entering that rest. Just like they did. And now look what he says. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. That just comes out of nowhere. When did God finish his works that he finished from the foundation of the world? When did he finish his works? Well, okay, sixth day, end of sixth day, which is the seventh day, the Shabbat. And it just comes out of nowhere. All of a sudden he's talking about the seventh day, and he's talking about the rest. Today you hear his voice from your heart, your heart. Like I said, then today will not enter my rest. And then I say to you, they shall not enter my rest. And then all of a sudden he talks about the seventh day. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said concerning the seventh day. Why would he say that? And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, and now he says it again. They shall not enter my rest. So therefore, the rest that they did not enter was what? No. The seventh, what? The seventh what? The seventh what? The seventh day, the seventh day. Not the land. It was a seventh day, specifically seventh day. And he says it here, now he said it five times. Five times. God rests on the seventh day. From all his works, again in this country, they shall not enter my Menuchah, my rest. For if Joshua had given them rest. What did Joshua lead Israel into? The land. The land, the land right? That's not where they were going. They weren't going to the land. They weren't supposed to be going to the land. Well, God was going to give them the land. But that wasn't where they were going. They were going with Joshua into the seventh day of rest. Into the big seventh day of rest. Now, nobody knows this. Nobody knows this. But everybody should know this. And it's so simple. He says it over and over and over again. He would not have spoken of another... Why does it say land? Because they were going into a day. Not a land. God says, I'm going to give you the land, Israel. I'm going to take you up out of Egypt. I'm going to give you the land. Okay, fine. But the land was not where they were headed. It was the day of the Lord, the kingdom. The seventh day. Now, the land is a picture of that. But it's not the ultimate ending. And that's not where Joshua was trying to lead them. And it's not where Moses was trying to lead them. Consequently, there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. Okay. In case you don't know, this is why we keep Shabbat. We keep Shabbat as a rehearsal of that day that's coming. So, this time period, this long time period, <coughs> called today, started at the beginning of time. And it goes all the way to the end of the sixth day. And then comes the seventh day. And by the way, I chopped out the part about David. It says, like it says to David after such a long time, today, calls it today again. So David is during today. Moses was during today. The first century time of Yeshua was during today. Our time is during today. 
But there's another day coming after today called the seventh day, the seventh, the rest, the day of rest, a day, seventh day, Sabbath, rest, and it's also called the day of the Lord. That's our hope. That was supposed to be their hope, but it was not. All right, so now we're going to return to the, the meat of the teaching, I hope. Choice. We talk about choice. You, you can choose whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Whatever you want. Good, bad, indifferent. You can do whatever you want. We were made to have desires. God made us with desires. We have desires. God gave them to us. The trick is to harness your desire. Or like, you know, like when you're riding a horse and you pull on the reins and give direction and structure and control. You give control to your desires so that you control them and they don't control you. Me. So that they don't control me. I put my desires, I try to anyway, put my desires under my control by doing Judaism. That's how we control our desires. By doing Judaism. The more Judaism we do, the more practice we become at controlling our desires. But we can choose anything we want. And if you don't think that we can mess up God's plan, you are wrong. And this is a prime example. Now God found a workaround, just like he did in some other examples I'll show you, but that doesn't mean it didn't mess up God's plan. It didn't mean it didn't throw a monkey wrench in the works, because it did. And we do it all the time. We throw monkey wrenches into God's works all the time. And then we go, oh, why? Why is this happening to me? Well, because you threw a monkey wrench in the works. You did the wrong thing. You made stupid choices. And now, you know, this is what happens. Like gravity. If you're holding a vase, a Ming vase, and you drop it, you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. So, you know, this is the whole thing about life, is making good choices. That's what Judaism gives us the ability to know what to choose. I'm a very, very confused person. I never know which way to go. I don't know if I should go left, right, up, down. I don't know. I, I have no direction in life. I was raised by wolves. I don't know what's right and wrong. I don't know. The only guidance I've gotten is since I've been married to Eileen. And she has more of a, a, a compass that says, that's right and that's wrong. And for the first 20 years of our marriage, I wouldn't listen. So now I try to listen because she's got a better compass than I do. But what I have learned, I have learned by doing Judaism. And so now I'm starting to get a better sense of which way do I go? Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go straight? What do I do? Now I'm getting a, a better sense of it. So please don't think I'm telling you, you need to be like me. Don't be like me. Don't do that. <laughs> be like scripture. Be like, like, like Moshe. Be like Yeshua. But they did the Torah almost perfectly. I don't. All right, so let's talk about free choice. Now he says in the verse, Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, You, Moshe, send out men for yourself. For yourself. Right? Send out men for you to tour the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send one man, one man, from each of their father's tribes, all leaders among them. So, this uh, send out for yourself, in Hebrew is shalach lecha anashim. Shalach, apostle, or send, send out. Shalach, shaliach is an apostle. Lecha, to you, to you, anashim, men. So he says, send out to you, men, or for you. Now, there's other examples in the Bible where it says the same kind of phrase, lecha, to you, shalach. Genesis 12, 1 says, lech lecha, 
Go to yourself. It's translated, go out from, I don't know how it says it, go, go out from your land, your country, your family. But in Hebrew it says, go to yourself. I'm sorry, left lecha. So what does that mean? God is giving Moshe a choice. He's saying, look, I'm not commanding you to do it. I'm saying, if you want to do it, you think it's good? Do it. Shalach lecha. Send for yourself. It's a choice. It's your own choice. Now, I've been a believer for 42 years, I think. 42 years, something like that. And from what I've seen, people sp uh, spiritualize issues so they don't have to make a choice. I did it too. I mean, it's not just, it's not just people I've watched. I've done it too. So I'll give you an example. Like, uh, it feels like God is pushing me in a certain way. Like God is pushing me in a certain way, like opening these doors, closing other doors. And it seems like God is pushing me in that way. And I want that thing. And, you know, like I'll spiritualize it and say, God is forcing me into that. Hey, he might be wanting me to go that way, but he doesn't force us. Or I might say, oh Lord, you take it and you give me, give me the, give, change my heart so that I'll not want to marry that married man. I've heard that. I've heard a married woman saying about, you know, she wants to marry a married man, another married man. And she super spiritualized it and said, oh, God changed my heart. Okay, we, we all do this because we don't want to be so cut loose and, and free to say, I want. This is what I want. I want that. It's scary to do that. It can be. It can be scary to say, I want. But that's what God gave us. He gave us, it's called in Hebrew, Ratzon. A want, ratzon. We're supposed to want. The trick is to want what God wants. But you cannot do that if you spiritualize everything. You can't. You have to be logical, rational, down to earth, and God will help you figure it out. This is what I've discovered. But you've got to be honest with yourself. So, in my opinion, when God said to Abraham, Lech lecha, go to yourself. He wasn't commanding Abraham to leave Ur. He was saying, hey Abraham, leaving it up to you. Go to you. And so he did. He did it. He left Ur and he went into the only guy on the planet who knew the God of Israel. Leviticus 23.15, we just finished the counting of the Omer. You shall count the Omer to yourself. Uspartem lachem. And spartem, you shall count lachem to yourself, to you. You don't have to. You don't have to count the Omer to you. It's a choice. So the whole trick about Judaism and knowing God is to choose to do or not to do. It's your choice. You don't have to obey a command. There are no commands. I'm sorry to break it to you, but there are no commandments. There are pictures that you can act out, you can do or not do. If you do them, God will talk to you, maybe. If you don't do them, you got no choice of God not talking to you. He will not talk to you because that's what he gave you to talk through. It's like curriculum in school. You can choose to follow the class curriculum and be a good student, but if you don't go to class for sure, you ain't gonna learn nothing. It ain't gonna happen. Well, it's the same way with, with uh, the scripture. With Judaism, you shall count to yourself 
Deuteronomy 16, 18. Judges, you shall give to yourself when you come into the land. Shotim, titim lacha. Judges, you shall give to you, to yourself. Isn't that weird? Give yourself judges. So it's not a command. It's like, it's your choice. Pick the guys you want. You understand what I'm saying? So it's your choice. You got you to use your, your chooser. 1 Samuel 10, when David counted Israel, he should not have, but he counted Israel, and there were 70,000 Jews that were killed by an angel that stood above Jerusalem with a scimitar in his hand. God said to him, when these, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one, second Samuel 24. God says to him, choose for yourself which spanking you want. Do you want me to spank you with a rod? Do you want me to spank you with an electric cord? Or do you want me to spank you with a feather? Well, actually, that wasn't one of the choices. Do you want me to spank you with an iron? I mean, it was three horrible choices. But he tells him, choose for you. What do you want? Bahar lecha. Choose for you. This one in 1 Samuel 10, it's talking about Saul. And Saul, uh, it was when he was being chosen as king. When these signs come, do for yourself what the occasion requires. Ase lecha. Now, the Bible says that, and I'm like, what? I don't know what to do. Choose for yourself, you know, do whatever the occasion requires. I don't know what that is. But if you're doing Judaism, you have a chance of having, it's called ethics. Ethics is right and wrong. Right, Becca? Ethics is, I asked that Becca yesterday. Eth Becca, what is ethics? Because she had a class that she's going to take, or she took in ethics, right? She took a class in ethics. And I said, what is ethics? And I asked her because I was doing this teaching, I was studying this teaching. And she said, it's right and wrong. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. In her field, right and wrong. What about in your field? Which is life. What about our field, which is just life? What's right, what's wrong? Well, as you do Judaism, you learn what right and wrong is, so that you can bakar lecha, bakar lecha. Choose for yourself. Choose for yourself. It, I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't think people like to talk about this much. In, you know, like believers, I don't think they like to talk about choice. They like to talk about pro-choice and pro-life. They don't like to talk about just choice. Just what do you want? What do you choose? What do you want? But it's important. What do you want? The Lord spoke to Moshe saying, send out men for yourself to tour the land of Canaan. So now I'm going to show you the ultimate example. Well, may, maybe the uh, God saying on the ninth of Av, you're never entering the kingdom. Maybe that was the ultimate example. But there was another example later on that's just as big. It says in Deuteronomy 17 about the king of Israel. Well, wait, let me say this. Who said Israel should have a king? Who, whose idea was it? You say the people? Do you agree? Some people say Moses. Some people say Israel. Some people say God. So didn't God want a king over Israel? King David, King Solomon, the last ten kings, Yotam, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Josiah, Ammon, Yehoahaz, Yehoakim, Yehoakim, Zedekiah. Didn't God want the kings? That went on for 480 years. So Deuteronomy 17 says, when you enter the land the Lord has given you, and you say, I will appoint a king. I, my choice, I will appoint a king over me like the Gentiles. Is that good or bad? Horrible. And he's saying, 
this is what you're going to do, Israel. You're going to say, I want to be like all the Gentiles. But I've, given, but I've made you different. If you want to be like all the Gentiles who are around me, you shall appoint a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. Who God chooses. Whose idea is it going to be? No! When you enter the land and you say, I will appoint a king over me, whose idea was it, was it going to be? Yeah, God prophesies through Moses and says, in time to come, you're going to say you want a king so you can be like the Gentiles. But then it says, whom the Lord your God chooses. So, God's choice and our choice are supposed to work together. They're supposed to. And I know that's, you know, I'm saying a big statement. It's harder, easier said than done, harder to do. But this is how it's supposed to be. First Samuel 8 says, once, once they came in the land, they said they wanted a king. The elders of Israel came to Shmuel and they said, appoint us a king to judge us like all the Gentiles do. And the thing was evil to Samuel. And the Lord said, listen to the voice of the people. Listen to them. Because they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So what is God doing? He's seeking an occasion against them. Remember in that passage that Rashi said? Uh, I'm sorry, wrong one. There it is. Now I will give them the opportunity to make a mistake through the words of the spies so that they will not inherit it. This is a, the, the reason Rashi said that is because of the story in Samuel when they wanted a king. Same thing happened. The people, well, listen to the voice of the people because they have not rejected you, but they've rejected you. What's the, why does God say listen to them? Because he's seeking an occasion to, re to reject them, to, to, to spank them. 1 Samuel 8, 19, the people refused to listen to Shmuel and said, there shall be a king over us, so we can be like all the Gentiles. You know, uh, you said, que lastima. I agree. Those some of the saddest words in the Bible. Where the Jewish people say, we want to be like the Gentiles. That's not, that's not why God created the Jew. It was to lead the Gentiles. So they can become like the Jew. Not so the Jew can become like the Gentile. And Shmuel, he goes and he goes, God, guess what they said? Repeat this to the Lord. And he said, the Lord said, listen to their voice and appoint a king for them. Whose idea was it to have the king? The people's. And who chose the king? God. Just like he said he would in Deuteronomy. In 1 Samuel 12, when you saw that Nahash, the king of Ammon, this is, this is Samuel telling the Jews, what are you doing? God is your king. You're doing the wrong thing, but I'll give you a king. When you saw that Nahash, the king of Ammon, was coming against you, you said, No, but a king shall reign over us. That the Lord your God was your king. And now, look, the king whom you, you have chosen. But God said, Whom the Lord chooses. So, it was both. God chose and the people chose. But the initial idea wasn't God's, it was the people's. So choice is a really tough, dangerous thing. I could tell a million stories about choice, but I'm not going to. I think this helps us understand how this works. You need, you need to find a way to say what you want and be honest. I want that. When I pray for people, it's so hard to get people to say what they want. And a lot of times people say what they want and it's stupid. It's ridiculous. It's wrong. 
It's just lustful or selfish or greedy or something. Once I finally dig in and figure out what's going on, then I repeat to them, what do you want? And then they say what they want, and then God can make a choice. God can get things rolling. But if you can't say what you want, God cannot help you to get that choice made. Our choice and God's choice have to work together because we have free will. And now, the king whom you have chosen, whom you have asked for, behold, the Lord has put a king over you. So, God made it happen. All right, where were they headed, the Jews in the, in the wilderness? Where were they headed? Where were they headed? Wrong. The kingdom. <laughs> they were headed for the kingdom. They just didn't know it, right? They're going to the kingdom. Now, when he says, go into the, into the land and see what it is, it says, uh, see what the kingdom is. I'm going to read this in picture form. It says, see what the land is. But that's not what... What it is, it's really the kingdom. Now, follow what I'm saying. You are supposed to be going into the kingdom every day. You're supposed to be. You're supposed to be going into the kingdom multiple times a day. And that's not just through meditation and prayer. That means by studying the scriptures, by doing the Jewish prayers. By doing this, we enter the kingdom. And you have to be thinking, What's it going to be like in the kingdom? You've got to find out. So let's read land as kingdom and see what it's saying to us. See what the land, what the kingdom is, and whether the people who live in it, who live in the kingdom, are strong or weak. So say you're reading the Bible, and it shoots you into the future, to the day of the Lord, to the kingdom. Are the people there strong or weak? Maybe you don't even know enough to answer. Maybe you're thinking about the book of Revelation or something. I don't know. But think about it. We're going to be in the kingdom for a thousand years, yes? Yeah. We're going to be ruling with Messiah for a thousand years. Doing Judaism, forcing the world to do Judaism. If that's necessary. There are verses that say it's necessary in some cases. So we are going to be putting God's ways into the world. Are the people who live in that kingdom strong or weak? Both. Some are going to be strong, some are going to be weak. What's rank in the kingdom? We all have rank in the kingdom. Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19, that our rank comes from the one who does and teaches the smallest mitzvah, the smallest, quote, commandment, will be called great in the kingdom, in the messianic kingdom. The one who rejects and preaches against the smallest mitzvah will be called least in the kingdom. That's where our rank comes from. Some are strong, some are weak. What are you going to be like? It changes over time. Whether they in the kingdom are few or many. Is there going to be many or few in the kingdom? Yeshua said, few there are who enter into the kingdom. Right? There are few who get into the kingdom because the way into it is really, really tight and narrow. Didn't he say that? Yeah. So there's not going to be many. There's going to be few. However, you might be over many. If you do a lot of Judaism and you have a high rank, you might have a lot of people under you. I don't know. You need to find out. What are you going to be doing in the kingdom? What's your rank going to be? There are going to be few or many with you, under you, over you, next to you. And how, he says to him, how is the kingdom? See what the land, see what the kingdom is. How is the kingdom? How is the kingdom? He says it three times. How is the land? How is the land? See what the land is like. And how is the kingdom in which they live? Is it good or bad? Is the kingdom good or bad? Then why don't you go to it more? 
If you think it's good, why don't you go to it more? Why don't you go to it 50 times a day? If it's good. See what I'm saying? We don't think the kingdom is good. We think it's bad. Or else we'd be running to it 50 times a day. But we like this garbage dump, this sewer that we live in. We like this. We don't like that. The kingdom. But it's good, but we don't view it as good. We don't. Once in a while we get a glimpse and we're like, ooh, that's good. But that is not all the time. You know it's true. Am I right? Yeah. We, we, or else we'd be running to the kingdom 500 times a day to eat from the Torah, but we don't. Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live in the kingdom? Are they in open camps or in fortifications? What do you think that's talking about? In the kingdom, are the people going to live in open camps or fortifications? I'm not even going to talk about that. Says it again. And how is the kingdom? Is it productive or is it unproductive? What do you think? Things productive or unproductive? Productive. Yeah, we have to go in and work it. Right. Is there a tree? Now, this is what it says in Hebrew. Is there a tree, singular, in it, in the kingdom? Is there a tree in the kingdom? Yes. Now, a tree in the Bible is a man. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 20, it says, Ki ha'adam etz For man is a tree of the field. Man is a tree, okay? So when it says, is there a tree, singular, you could say a man. Is there a man? Like somebody, is, it, it could be a woman too, but somebody who's strong. Is there a strong man, a strong soul in the kingdom or not? So I could say a lot about this, but I'm just going to go to the next slide because this leads right into it. That people are trees and people produce fruit. And so there is therefore fruit in the kingdom. Not fruit here, not like, oh, I don't listen to him because I checked his fruit and it's not good. There's no scripture that says that. The fruit is fruit in the kingdom. But the trick is to see that it's fruit in the kingdom, not here. Is there a man? Is there a tree in it or not? And show yourselves courageous. Show yourself to be strong and go get some of that fruit. So that's what I would say to you. Show yourself courageous enough to go to the kingdom and get the fruit from the kingdom. Well, how do you do that? Judaism. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying you, 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 you. I'm saying us, 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 us. Because I have to think, I, I think of the same thing for me. Are you going to be a man? Or are you going to wuss out and be rooted to this earth? It takes a strength, it takes courage. It takes courage to get your mind on the Messianic Kingdom. And to not give in to the hype of end times prophecy. Because there's no such thing as end times prophecy. We are all supposed to know the day of the Lord, the Messianic Kingdom. We're supposed to know when it is, we're supposed to know the details of it. We're supposed to know where we're going to be. We're supposed to know what we're going to be doing. We're supposed to know how much rank we have. We're supposed to know everything about the kingdom. I've been studying the kingdom for 35 years. And I feel like just in the last, I'd say, eight years, I'm actually starting to get a real tight sense of it in my mind. Because I was too rooted to the earth. I wanted too much. I want it too much. I want for me. And as I'm stopping that, wanting for me so much, and taking control of my ratzon, my, my will, my wants, and instead of it controlling me, I feel like I'm getting a better picture of the day of the Lord. I can understand it better. That's what we're supposed to be doing, but that takes courage. People don't want it for the most part. But here's, 
Here's the most important thing. You know, it's not the fruit of the Spirit. Like people think the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? It's the fruit of the kingdom. And you, you may be able to say, love, joy, peace, patience, blah, 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 whatever. So what? If you don't know it from the kingdom, you don't know what it is. You've got to have some context for what it means. For, for what, like, what, what is love? What is love? That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Is it like, oh my God, I love him so much. That, that's not love. That's not biblical kingdom love. How about joy? Joy isn't just being happy. What is it in the kingdom? I'll give you, I'm gonna, this is hard, but this is what the scriptures say. How happy, how joyful will the man be, will the one be who grabs the Babylonian baby by the feet and bashes its head against the stones? That's in Psalm 133. That's weird, isn't it? Well, we don't know what joy is. We don't know what love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. We don't know what those are. Not unless there's some context of them coming from the kingdom. That's where they are. That's where they, fun they will function in the future. So for us to function now like we're in the kingdom, that's what Yeshua said he wanted. You're in the, the kingdom is here now. Act like it. Okay. How? So we have that the land is kingdom. We have that people are trees. Yeah? yeah? Okay, these are correlators. These are laws, if you like that. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, doesn't stand in the way, the derech, the way, the walk of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. That means like people make fun of everything. Like I was. But his delight is in the Torah of the Lord. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. How do you meditate on the Torah if you're asleep? But you can. Day and night. And in his Torah he meditates day and night, and he shall be a tree. He shall be like a tree, Ka'etz, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. Whose fruit? My fruit? God's fruit? The kingdom's fruit? His leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does will prosper. Whatever he does will prosper. You got fruit. Now these guys who went into the land to get the fruit. Remember Moses said, be strong, be courageous, and go get some fruit. What? Why does that take courage to go into some land and get some fruit? So what? There's giants... He could have said, be strong and courageous and go kill some giants. That would take, say it again. Yeah, it could be trespassing, but, but you know, it might not be. But if you say, go kill some giants, yeah, that would take some courage. But not just to go get some fruit. And yet that's all he said about being courageous. Isn't that weird? That's all he said about being strong and courageous. Go get some fruit. Where were they going into? Come on. Where were they going into? The kingdom. Get the fruit from there. That takes courage. That takes courage. It doesn't take much courage to go grab some grapes and pomegranates and figs. But it takes a lot of courage to go into a day that you've never been to. That you don't even know what it is. But God showed it to you. And to get the fruit from that time period and bring it back and make it work in your life. That takes courage. And that's what he was telling them. This is not Caleb and Joshua, by the way. Most people think that it was Caleb and Joshua who got the fruit. It was not. Rashi specifically says it was not Caleb and Joshua. Then he tells how it was done. 
Isaiah 4, 2 says, In that day the branch of the Lord. Now why do I have this verse? Because it says, Then they cut off a branch. Samach. It's a title for the Messiah. With a single cluster, an eshkol, of grapes. And they carried them on a pole between two with some pomegranates and some figs. So, in that day, the branch of the Lord, the branch is, is the Messiah. Branch is a title for the Messiah. Of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth in that day. So it's not the earth now. This isn't talking about how much fruit Israel produces that they make the best oranges in the Middle East. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about in the day of the Lord, the fruit of the people, the fruit of the earth of the people, the pride and the beauty of the survivors of Israel. Now, if you're having trouble following what I'm saying, the bottom line is this. The only fruit that's in that kingdom belongs to Israel. That's the only fruit there is in the kingdom. Belongs to Israel. Moses told Israel, go in there and get your fruit. You better be strong and courageous to do it. Go get some fruit. So they came out with fruit from the land. But they didn't come back with fruit from the kingdom because the first thing they did it says they showed them the fruit and they said look look how beautiful the fruit is we can't go up and take it there's giants in there so don't be you know fooled by all the beautiful fruit they never got the fruit from the kingdom they got the fruit from Canaan which is neither here nor there who cares Isaiah 5 says, let me sing a song for my beloved about, uh, uh, about his vineyard. The vineyard of the Lord is, is the house of Israel. But Christians like the verse in John that says, I am the vine and you are the branches. But it says in Isaiah that Israel is the vine. Yeah, but it says in John 15 that Jesus is the vine. Yeah, but it says in Isaiah 5 that Israel is the vine. Yeah, but it says that in John 15 that Jesus is the vine. Yeah, but it says in Isaiah 15. This can go on forever. So which one's right? Yes. Right. Israel came first. Israel is the vine of God. And so Yeshua is the vine. Only because Israel is the vine. Because Israel and Yeshua are one and the same. What Israel said, Yeshua says. What Israel did, Yeshua does, did and does. What Israel shows, Yeshua shows. They, Yeshua is Judaism in the flesh. Judaism in the flesh. Let me sing a song, my beloved, about his vineyard. The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah is beautiful plant. Israel is the vine. And then in John, Yeshua says, I'm the vine. You are the... I thought branch was a title for the Messiah. You see what he did? You see what he did there? He flipped it. Yeah. So now he says, I'm the vine, but because Israel and him are synonymous of the same. And the offshoots from that are, this kind of might confuse you, the Meshichim. The word for quote Christians in Hebrew, you know what it is? Messiahs, Messiah ones, Mashiachim. Mashiach is Christ or Messiah, and the people of Messiah is not Christian, it's Messiah ones, Mashiachim. So because Yeshua is the Messiah, we are the Messiahs, so to speak, because we are in Messiah. He's in us. So we're like little representations of him. Yeah, little offshoots from that vine. But all of it's Jewish. All of it's Israel. Can't get away from it. All of it's Israel. The one who remains in me, in Judaism, in Israel, in Yeshua, and I in him, Bears a whole bunch of fruit. But again, where is this fruit coming from? 
from the kingdom. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So I hope this puts a little spin, a better spin, on this verse. That it's, it's talking about the kingdom. It's talking about Israel. It's talking about the promise to Israel for a, a land, a day. The kingdom. That's our hope. So you can't have the kingdom come out of you unless you know what the kingdom is. And it ain't. What are the uh, end time prophecy? That's not what it is. It's the day of the Lord. Matthew 21. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Israel. When did God take away the kingdom from Israel? You will never enter my kingdom. When was that? Ninth of Av. The kingdom will be taken away from you, Israel, he's talking to Israel, and given to a people producing its fruit. What's fruit? The kingdom. He just said, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has fruit, right? He just said it. What fruit? How do you get that fruit? Where is it? How do you get it? Judaism. That's the only way to get that fruit. It, it, there's no other way. There is no other way to get it. The prayers of Judaism are laid out by God to teach us the kingdom. The scriptures are laid out by God to teach us the kingdom. And every single thing in Judaism is a picture of the kingdom. So, we're, so that we can know it. That's how we get the fruit. So... If you haven't done one prayer, daily prayer, do one. Just do one. And the next week, do two. And the next week, bring it up to three. And keep adding. But start somewhere. Don't just sit around and not start. Start. Yeah, you can start. I mean, a Rabbi Akiva started at the age of 80. So you got no excuse. He became the biggest guy in the whole place. And he started at the age of 80. You know why? Because he saw water trickling onto a rock. And he saw that it had worn away the rock. And he said, wow, it's been doing that a long time. I guess it's never too late to start. And he became the biggest sage in the whole place. Started at the age of 80. So... There's no excuse to not do something. There's Shachrit, Mincha, Musaf, Ma'ariv. Those are the four prayers. Prayer services each day. We're supposed to pray three times a day. Shachrit, Mincha, and Ma'ariv, which is evening. If you've never done it, get a prayer book. A Jewish prayer book. And just like a little kid. Start working your way through it as best you can. There's no, 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 nobody's standing over you with a whip. Nobody's forcing you to do anything. It's your choice. It's your choice. And the more you learn, the more fruit you're going to get from the kingdom, the more you're going to change, the more you're going to grow, the better a person you will be. And like Psalm 1 says, Whatsoever he does will prosper. So the churches can preach prosperity all day, every day. But it's not this. The real prosperity is knowing God. It's not having stuff. It's knowing God. So if you want to know God, come to know him the way he gave to know him, which is Judaism. Let's pray. Abba, thank you that you made us into trees. That all of us are trees. And you've got fruit for us in the kingdom, just waiting. And I want that fruit, Lord. I want it. I want it more than I want anything now. And I ask that you would show it to me so I can get it. Show me how to get it. Help me to be courageous to get it. Not to be scared. Because of losing whatever in this world. I ask that you give us courage and strength 
and build up your body, build up your people so that they can have the desire inside of them to just forget everything else and just want to know you. Light that fire in your people, Lord, to want to know you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.